How do you grow into one of the world's most innovative floriculture companies? It begins with a dream and the imagination to make beautiful things grow beautifully. It takes time to root and demands a never-ending passion for breeding and producing annuals, perennials, and cut flowers that spark the imagination, that shape the market, inspiring customers, and bringing people closer together. Growing into a floriculture innovation leader means embracing cutting-edge genetic technologies. It also demands cultivating world-leading R&D capabilities and expertise. create varieties that customers love and growers trust. It requires investing in a global presence that ensures superior quality products reach customers wherever they are. For the past 70 years, Danziger has cultivated innovation and family tradition, blending passion with professionalism, enhancing technological excellence with trusted collaboration. What about the next 70 years? We leave that for the imagination. Hello, I'm Kelly Rada, Editorial Director at Greenhouse Management and Nursery Management Magazines and contributor to Garden Center Magazine. I'd like to welcome you to Danziger Talks, where influencers and market experts share their insights on market trends. We're glad you're here because keeping up with indoor and outdoor design and lifestyle trends is vital to the green industry in each one of your businesses. But before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in a few days on our website. We also have time for questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit your questions anytime by using the Q&A function in your Zoom taskbar. To begin, we'll dive into color forecasting and how to use color stories in your marketing and point of purchase materials with Peggy Van Allen, president of Color Marketing Group. Peggy is a designer and color anthropologist with a background in graphic design and experience in trend research, visual merchandising, and palette development. Her unique skill set allows her to visually communicate the complexities of color. Thank you, Peggy. Hello, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm really excited to share a peek at the forecasting process for Color Marketing Group. How do we do it? How can we forecast colors? What do we do with the trend information and what are we seeing for 2022 on a larger scale for colors directional movements? Color Marketing Group is the premier international association for color design professionals. Our uniqueness is in our mission of creating accurate and relevant color and trend forecast information by connecting global, co global color professionals in their shared passion. So choosing color, color is personal and we have our own associations related with colors, often it's memories that inspire our preferences and our dislikes. There's research supporting the psychological effects and we have symbols associated with colors as well. So how do companies decide which colors to use for their products or which colors if they have a large selection, which ones to highlight? How do brands choose the colors to represent their brand? This is where someone like myself comes in. I, along with many other color forecasters, do that work to figure out those color questions. I'm a designer and color anthropologist. I study human behavior in order to forecast color and design trends, and this enables my clients to harness the power of color. I've been a member of Color Marketing Group for over 25 years, and now I'm serving as president. So understanding color trends is important. We need to understand where consumers are today with color and what direction their preferences are moving. Color psychology is a tricky science. If you've heard much about how color affects us physiologically, there are some general and true statements. Reds are passionate, they can signal danger. Black is somber and serious. Green is nature-based and soothing. True, all those things are true, but the nuances of color are just as important. Which side of blue? Is it dark? Is it light? Is it soft? Is it saturated? Is it leaning towards purple or teal? These nuances are important and often reflect the color, the, often reflect the story behind a color's shift to prominence in our current state of mind. Color psychology is an important bit of where I have to explore when I'm doing my research. I'm not a color psychologist, but I understand its importance in what I do. 
Ultimately, that is helping people to choose color that they will be happy with and that will make them feel good. We need to understand how our brains work, the psychology and what the exterior drivers and influences will be. We are always watching and listening and analyzing. And we as forecasters find that telling stories is the best way to inspire and educate people. To forecast trends in color, you need to be able to organize and understand the ways that we track and categorize and understand behaviors. Every year when I do my forecasting, I start with a review of the megatrends. This can be found through quite a few different trend services that are online, but really as forecasters, we're always watching and analyzing what we see around us. We attend trade shows, we follow news sources, sometimes it's industry related, sometimes it's in adjacent industries and any industry really that is more trend driven. This is a snapshot of the process by which CMG captures the world color forecast. It begins with the research done by all the color experts who contribute, both members and non-members. We have live and virtual chromosome workshops where the stories and the colors are gathered. We have more extensive workshops in Asia Pacific, Latin America, and European regions. And then all the workshop results are steered into the regional forecasts and the compilation of those four regions make up the world color forecast, which we reveal at the summit. The final step, of course, is then the members apply those forecasted colors to their industries. Participants come from various industries. It's a deep dive into human behavior, economy, politics, and it's global and local. In each chromosome, we determine the three top color trend stories and we develop a forecast of 16 colors that derive from those, from those stories. So in our 2022 world color forecast, here are the 12 stories, three from each region. We see there are similarities across the world. We talked about the duality of digital and real world with communities of change in North America and safe harbor in Asia Pacific. Cloud life in Asia Pacific and semimorphosis in Latin America also touched on that physical digital. Semimorphosis and resilience in Europe had a focus on change and growth and resilience. We talked about emotion and desire for a simpler life with sine qua non in Latin America and hungry senses in Europe. The environment and climate change, they remain important and were the focus of Latin America's revival, North America's unbiased and Europe's less essential be fearless and activism. They were tied to finding our voices. While we see these color stories unfold in the discussions, those key concepts continually come to the surface even as they are represented in different ways. Now we don't, we don't have time to go through all these color stories. So I pulled out what I think will be relevant to our audience today. Maybe this seems like too many colors. Ah, you're overwhelmed. So I'm gonna dive into the stories and the colors that I think are relevant to you and your consumers. A prevailing theme that we saw continuing in North America was one of distrust. This was our overarching theme. As we face the reality that our definition and sources of truths conflict with, with each other, we have doubts and about trust and truths. Accepted truths are attached to our personal identities. When you, when you disagree with my truth, you are disagreeing with me. Something that we all must keep in mind as we speak to our consumers. Are we transparent and presenting our information and stories in a way that not only is factual, but resonates as truthful? Moving forward, we may achieve clarity by embracing scientific truths. So our first color story for North America, we called unbias. As we move toward the future, we anticipate that bioscience, nanotechnology, biomimicry, and biocodes will work holistically with nature to reveal discoveries for humanity. We look ahead to climate change doctrines and net zero emission efforts to become a key focus for renewable energy. So the color direction for unbias incarnates the essence of pure and clean. With the exception of Nanu Nanu, all the colors are vibrant and saturated, bright, energized colors full of light and life. In Europe, a similar color story focusing more on the environment is less essential. This story is about sharing space with nature and creating an environment where both can flourish through smart cities, sustainable production, reducing consumption, as well as physical and mental decluttering of our homes and ourselves. Biophilic design becomes key where architecture and public spaces live side by side with nature. In Latin America, we have the story revival. We look at nature with new eyes. As nature started healing from the disastrous pollution we inflicted on it over the years, our relationship with the environment was transformed. Our views about consumption are changing. The search for more organic food becomes authentic we will rethink the concept of eco-living by incorporating more natural surroundings into the interior spaces. 
So then how do the members of CMG apply these colors? We can look at this particular trend. We do, some of the colors may or may not be uh, applicable to every industry, but we look at the evolution of where the colors are currently and where they have been recently. Finishes and materials can shift things. Each application may vary in its use of color and in the timing of when they are actually brought to the market. Saturation levels, lightness, darkness, et cetera, anything, they can all be tweaked to be appropriate in their context. But the underlying story and the drivers that led us here are what inform us. With the colors, the neutrals are green influenced and literally tell the nature environment concern story. It ranges from greens to browns to sea to sky. Yellows are warm and convey the optimism. Kurkuma is more of a home product color, while response would be more attention getting and used in marketing and branding. The oranges here, they shifted to a much more saturated sense, but overall there are fewer oranges, so they needed to have some punch. Fervor is a classic bold red, while Seeker is a statement about empowerment, but it also had a tech influence in, in that it was very high saturated. The greens range from blue green to acidic yellow greens, symbolic of new growth. So our second color story interprets the notion of fear and being fearless. When uncomfortable, when uncomfortable situations strike and affect humanity on a global scale, there's a mass awakening that develops and we go into reevaluation mode. We experienced trauma, we are scarred. From the chaos, however, we shall emerge as survivors with a new sense of empowerment. We adapt and we can reconceive things in a new light, recognizing shifting inequalities, perspectives, and values. Trusting ourselves equips us with the power to find our voice. We grant ourselves permission to be fearless. We are living by our own rules, embracing differences while also respecting boundaries. The color direction for Be Fearless has two different paths. On one side, the forecast includes the, green, the clean grounded colors that serve as a base to build our new future. And then on the other side, the forecast introduces strong saturated colors, expressing the freedom attached to self-reliance. The Asia Pacific region called their story activism. It was also about finding your voice with a focus on the environmental protection. So a little bit of a tie back to the other trends too. Addressing the fashion industry, they talked about taking on additional responsibility to use sustainable resources, providing safe work working conditions to ensure our planet is habitable for future generations. And then the younger generation will be even more focused on political responsibility, standing up for what they believe in and what is right. So how will this translate into your industry? The colors are strong and bold, Colors like Seeker and Introspect and Uprising are genderless. They will they all have will be used across a broad spectrum of industries. Personalization is very important and having choices in your color options for products. Colors are used to get attention. Response used here was in the unbiased trend and also in the next trend. It's a strong, warm, saturated yellow that's all about opportunities. So it is supported from many angles. And true blue, also used in two trends, in this context focused on freedom. The seriousness of the protesting and search and the search that we're on to find our voice, the Asia Pacific story focusing on the climate concerns is what brings out the brown, like paper bag of that paper bag brown of buy local and darkness. It's an almost black and it balances the stronger reds that are in the palette. The orange red of people power from Asia Pacific. It's more of an angry red uh, for that region, shifting away from their patriotic reds that they usually have. And then within from North America, it's a warm red filled with emotion and courage. The color bridge, it also appears in the next trend. So I'll talk about a little, little bit more with that one. Our third and last story focuses on change in the communities. As consequences of the COVID crisis, we turned to our local communities for supplies, support and inspiration. And our local com community turned into a physical where we had the neighborhood shoe shop or the farmer's market, and then the digital, our, our virtual tribes. As humans, we are afraid of change, yet we adapt to coexist within our local and digital communities. We learned that we do not have to go far for the things that we need, and so that brought the focus into that hyper-local level. Uh, we realized that we could stay connected even by staying at home, so that second focus, our virtual tribe. The color direction for communities of change epitomizes that duality. The extreme of the, the kind, gentle colors that represent the geographical community, the local markets, the human support, and then those more saturated tech-influenced colors. The color story of Safe Harbor in Asia Pacific echoes some of the sentiments of North America 
And they introduce a new direction in that region. It's known for its traditional and patriotic vibrant colors, but here we have really low chroma hues that are driven by the desire to find respite at home. We will wrap ourselves with natural colors that will replicate the hues of a sunrise as we imagine ourselves at a lakeside in the safety of our own homes. These colors are restorative and promote hope, recovery, and comfort. So now looking at all the colors together, response here again, it's similar to the color hope in Asia Pacific. We have woven, hugging, and calm unity. They all have a human connection representing that need for sensory touch. New day, it's a fresh, inspiring red-based blue inviting us to start anew. So also it's a tie to hope and the new beginnings similar to the yellows. With local E and whetstone, they're low chroma, but they have a bit of green, they're cleansing, they have a connection to the physical and digital worlds. We also have the blue greens of revisited counterbalance and bridge. They signify the harmony that we seek. Bridge I mentioned earlier, it hovers between that freedom and that it's really saturated in the be fearless trend, but then also the local rooted feeling of communities of change. Also, we have uh, blue, the clarity. It represents ex expansive skies and clarity of thought. Now I will summarize even further by color family, showing a roundup of some images of the forecasted colors in use. The examples are commercial and residential, and some are outdoors. We're already seeing a presence of that optimistic yellow and gold. In the commercial market, we saw it combined with those rusty reds and the browns and sometimes blue. It's very warm and a textural feel that we're seeing in the materials that are used. In the orange and red family, here you see some examples again where it was combined with that optimistic yellow up in the upper right hand corner, but also with neutrals and browns that are all on the warmer side. There were bold organic floral graphic patterns as well as the more traditional patterns and combinations. The forecast predicts a downward trajectory to the orange family in general, but we notice almost all of the oranges were, that we um, selected for the forecast were highly saturated. In the green family, we did see some growth from 21 to 20 to 22 in the greens as we expected, and it continues with a wide variety symbolizing the different notions. Green represents balance, so the harmonious blue-greens, but then also yellow having that strong influence refer referencing nature and environmental concerns. Neutral greens also moving forward as calming colors in our combinations. The blues, they continue to play an important role in the forecast because they embody stability and a clear vision of the future. They do cover the spectrum from green influenced to red influenced. And then finally, the neutrals shown here represent the prevalence of the warming direction. We still see grays continuing, but also they're on the warm side. Overall, the neutrals are nature driven with an abundance of wood used in a raw looking form or aged and weathered. And most times it's in a matte finish. It has more touchability to satisfy our need for sensory touch. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. If you're interested in finding out more about the Color Marketing Group, our website is colormarketing.org, or you can contact our director, Sharon Griffiths at sgriffiths at colormarketing.org. We would love to have you join us. My email is also below, and you can go to my website, which is color-fuel.com, or find me on LinkedIn if you have more questions after this or you want some color assistance. Thank you. Next, we'll hear how outdoor living trends are likely to influence consumers' plant purchases from Phil Steinhauer, CEO and landscape architect at Designscapes Colorado. Phil's philosophy is that landscape construction is a way to convey taste and style. Whether your garden is classic in design or you take an innovative approach, your landscape is not something you buy, you have to create it. Behind the work of Phil Steinhauer and the design team at Designscapes Colorado is character, heart, and above all, a deep appreciation for the land. Phil approaches design to fit the local environment while blending the home and garden together. Thanks for your time today, Phil. What a pleasure it is to be asked by Dan Ziger to talk about trends in our in landscape industry. I'm here with Phil Steinhauer. He's been owner and landscape architect of Designscape Colorado for almost 30 years now. Um, so Phil, tell me, what trends have you been seeing within our industry this year? You know, probably the biggest trend, Marissa, is 
um, that 16 million people have taken up gardening um, this year, and that same study found that actually they're spending more than two hours a day in their landscape. Um, so I think that's significant when you look at, you know, a trend, um, and we're definitely seeing it in our business. We've had record uh, calls coming in um, for people requesting professional services, um, and I think that's partly because of people really realize the health benefit, you know, both mental and physical um, that landscaping can provide. And then they also are looking at it from an investment in their property values. So with that being said, how important is it for you to stay on top of these trends? You know, I think it's really important, um, one, to stay relevant, and then also be on top of these trends on what our clients are asking for um, so that I can give them, you know, informed decisions on their designs. Right. So what are people looking for? You know, it, it's funny. I would say um, that gardening now has really come, people are really looking for gardens with a purpose. Um, and I think what I mean by that is people are very specific in their needs, whether it's these outdoor rooms that we're creating, um, because they're also doubling as offices, as places where families are cooking outdoors a lot more now, um, dining al fresco. Um, people are also then using these for recreation. And I don't think that necessarily um, backyards are just for swing sets and football anymore. We're really seeing that homeowners are looking for places of all ages, uh, recreational games, whether it's badminton, whether it's pickleball, um, bocce ball, all of these family games are really important, I think, now. Um, and I think more than ever, we're seeing on top of all that, swimming pools really have become very popular. And I think what I guess I would attribute that trend to is with people traveling less, I think we're finding that people are building these resorts in their own backyard. And that doesn't necessarily, you know, from really big jobs to small jobs. I think people are just looking to utilize their gardens, kind of every square inch of their yards. They want it all. They want a vegetable garden. You know, they want a place to entertain. They want a fire pit or an outdoor fireplace. So all of these things have become really important to the landscape. That sounds awesome. Um, so with that, it sounds kind of complicated. Like there might be a lot of moving parts. So how does this um, take, what is the process I want to say? Well, I think more than ever, what we're seeing is that we're getting involved way sooner than normal. Landscape has really come to the forefront um, because of these things that I just mentioned. So we're working with architects and interior designers because it's so important that these outdoor spaces flow to the interior spaces and vice versa, that these interior spaces that our landscape frame the views, whether it's a swimming pool or an outdoor patio. Um, so these views and the connection between the two are really important. And that goes from everything from choosing materials so that the materials that are inside flow to the outside, as well as color schemes. Um, even the softening of these areas with flowers and plants. Um, we're seeing a lot of green walls. Um, we're seeing a lot of patio planters, whether it be for color, whether it be for vegetables. But these spaces are no longer sterile. They really are incorporating the landscape and really bringing um, and surrounding these spaces uh, with the landscape. So it sounds like plants are really important uh, to these outdoor living spaces. And I've noticed that in photographing our work. Plants are really important. In fact, the planting design is, is really the canvas that we have to work with. Um, and plants are our palette. Um, and, and really, if you really think about it, landscape design is a visual art. So texture and color um, and size and shape um, are really important. And one of the challenges we have as landscape designers and architects is really these things all grow. So, uh, you know, it looks different in winter than it does in summer. It also looks different five years from now than when I put it in, you know, next week. So that's really how important the plants are to 
um, softening these spaces and really creating an outdoor living environment. Um, so I would say it's, it's one of the most important things. Right. And one thing I've noticed from our sales team, a lot of um, home, homeowners are asking for their plants to come in larger sizes because they want that instant gratification. Is that accurate? Oh, yeah. I think we're seeing more and more um, people really want that instant gratification. They're willing to spend money on bigger trees. Um, they want fuller plants. Um, I think the variety of plants that we have to work with now, you know, changes every year um, with new improved varieties. And I think we're also seeing, uh, we hear the term a lot, low maintenance. So we're seeing a trend to doing easier gardens to care for, um, things that take care of themselves, things that are drought tolerant, um, that don't require as much water, that maybe are pest and disease resistant. So I think that kind of follows a trend in everybody's life. We want more time to ourselves. And um, I think the time that's spent in a garden is wanting to be growing vegetables and, and doing some of those things. It's not pruning and it's not taking care and weeding. It, it's more about enjoying that space that you're in. Right. And speaking of enjoying uh, your time in the garden, can you tell me a little bit more about what our vegetable gardens, what are people seeking in those? You know, that's funny. That's another big trend that we're seeing more. I think on almost every job I go on now, I'm putting in a vegetable garden. And these aren't just some little square foot gardening. These are big gardens where people are looking, you know, to have a variety of plants. They're really looking more at the heirloom varieties and unusual varieties. Um, like you might see in a gourmet grocery store. Um, berries and herbs are all, again, being incorporated. Um, I think we're even seeing that same trend in smaller gardens where people have patios or rooftop gardens where they're incorporating vegetables into their flower beds. Um, it creates a more naturalistic feel, but it is also something that people can then utilize and benefit from in their landscape. Definitely, and I just moved into a new apartment and I have a little balcony, so I'm super excited for next season to plant my own little vegetable garden and just to go out and tend to it and just have fresh food um, right outside my door, basically. And one of the things I'm very curious, um, give me a trend uh, that you've seen this last season that you haven't seen before. You know, I think probably this whole idea of working and staying at home more is probably the biggest trend, um, is people are enjoying their landscapes and it's really come to the forefront. Um, and I think, again, if I go back to what I said earlier, it's landscaping with a purpose. People are much more deliberate on what they're asking for, how they're going to use that space um, than five, ten years ago. Okay, Phil, so tell me, I'm sure our audience is wondering, what colors and styles are popular this season? You know, I think um, color in any form or any um, shade has been popular. Um, we are seeing, though, a lot of monochromatic gardens where people just want a blue garden or people just want a white garden. But I think more than anything, I'm seeing lots of color. Um, people are looking for, I think, some brightness um, in their yards. We've, you know, just come out of the pandemic. And so I think people are looking for a lot of color. Um, and then as far as style, I think I touched on, you know, low maintenance. But really, as a designer, I'm working with the architect and interior designer to really pick up, you know, the style of the house, the way the homeowner lives. So there's not really one style that I would say is more significant than another. So that's really interesting. I think we're all looking to add a little bit of brightness in our lives. Um, so Phil, that is all the time that we have for today. Um, I wanna thank you and thank Danzinger uh, for letting us do this. Do you have any final words? Yeah, I, I think it's been a pleasure. I think um, we're gonna be around or I'll be around for a Q&A afterwards. So please, if I've touched on something you want some more information on, uh, please feel free to you know, send in a question. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. For many millennial consumers, houseplants are the gateway drug to more plants, including colorful annuals and striking perennials. Today, we'll find out from Mariah Green what trends she's observed regarding indoor plants for both the indoor and outdoor space.
Mariah is a New York-based plant stylist and consultant. She's a graduate from the Bank Street College of Education, mastering general education and literacy. What started as an Instagram account filled with plant tips and tricks has blossomed into a full-blown business. As Mariah shifted from studying formal education to cultivating green spaces through Greenpeace, she understood that the same relationships and methods she developed in the classroom influenced her introduction of houseplant care and education to new and experienced plant parents alike. Thanks for being here today, Mariah. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to dive into some of the trends that we've all seemed to be seeing over the past couple of months, if not um, pre and post pandemic. Um, my name is Mariah Green. I go by the plant doctor and stylist here in New York City and just about everywhere. Um, and I'm the founder of Greenpeace, which is a plant styling and doctoring company that I founded in 2018. Um, the main goal when I started it was to help people with their house plants, um, whether it was repotting or matching people with the right plants for their space to make their plant care journey a bit easier. Um, and over the course of three years now, um, it just sort of developed into styling and also I've become a go to expert for publications and so it's been a really cool way to grow with people. Um, I've been in publications such as the New York Times, Vogue, Good Morning America, Arc Digest and a couple more. Um, and again, my main mission was to make sure that plant care and styling was accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so I found one main common theme as I was starting out, and I still find this to be the case, um, that there's just way too much contradictory information on Google. And you can go from one nursery or plant shop or um, anywhere that sells plants and get complete contradictory information about how to care for that same exact plant. And so what I wanted to do was take a look at all of the specific factors that make plant care uh, different for everyone um, and how uh, nurseries and plant shops can make this information as accessible and easy to understand as possible. So that's what I'm hoping to dive into today. Um, so some of the main trends we're going to cover are hanging plants and planters, um, how people are styling those and the ways that you can make those accessible. Um, textured and pattern foliage. Um, those tend to be the ones that my clients really like, especially if they're going from minimalist aesthetic. The plant can serve as that pop of color or that pattern that might not otherwise be in the space. The next trend we'll look at is arrangements versus larger potted plants. Um, and then the final one will be scheduling. People tend to have a better idea of what it means to have a watering schedule as opposed to just giving your plant little bits of water every single day. So now that people are catching on and getting more accurate information about how to care for their plants, there are ways that uh, buyers can implement these understandings into how they set up and sell their plants. So let's just start with hanging plants and planters. We're probably all familiar with the concept of the spiller, filler, and the thriller idea where you, where you get one of different types of plants and put them in that hanging basket and then put it maybe on your porch or your backyard, et cetera. However, my specialty is indoor plants. And while um, people absolutely love hanging planters for indoors as well, it doesn't, that concept doesn't really apply because you're looking at one main plant to be the star of the show. Because as we know, different house plants have different watering needs, different lighting needs, et cetera. So some of the ones that I see that people really, really love right now are Hartley philodendrons. I have one here that's gotten pretty long. Um, Polthos, for example, Hoya carnosas, um, and even ivies. So anything that sort of is long and trailing over time, um, people tend to really like having those in their windowsills or hanging from some space in their apartment. Um, the thing that I think is really important to note though is planters. So the drainage hole is something that I get asked about a lot. And I'm sure um, if you're selling plants in nursery pots that have those holes at the bottom, while it does have that hook at the top and it makes it look really easy to just hang in place and walk away, when it comes time to water it, you either have to take that down, take it to the sink and then water it, or you're reaching up on a ladder with a watering can and hopefully you're catching all the water that's coming out of the holes at the bottom. So one of the things that I think is important, especially from a seller's point of view, is if you are having any sort of installation or setup where people can look in the windowsill um, and assess whether or not they might want a hanging planter, having one uh, a plant that's still in the nursery pot and then putting it in a planter, a temporary planter, 
um, where you can take the plant in and out and that water can sort of be caught within the planter that it's sitting in is ideal. Um, and that just makes for an easier way for people to care for their plants. And sizing is really important because people are starting to understand the idea that you don't actually wanna pot your plant in something that's the exact same size as the original nursery pot. You wanna give it about an inch or two of rim and diameter so that it can grow. So while having a nice full and long hanging plant and a hanging planter is really nice, it's truly gonna to need to be repotted within a year or so. And so if you can set up a system where you have a smaller plant inside of a bigger planter and you're letting the person who's purchasing make that investment on their own, that's the way to go. Um, so we'll move on to textures and pattern foliage, because that seems to be a really common trend right now, or at least over the past year. Um, like I mentioned, the minimalist aesthetic has become extremely popular, and people rely on the foliage and um, the patterns within the foliage to be their pop or their center within their space. So some of the common ones I'm seeing are alocasia plants, uh, wandering Jews, calatheas, anything with any sort of texture, either on the tops or bottom of the leaves. And what's interesting is people really enjoy the pops of color or different textures, but they're putting them in simple planters such as white, black, terracotta, really, really simple so that the plant can be the star of the show. Um, and so while different planters exist, whether they're variety of colors or they're matte or they're glazed, those can serve as sort of a backdrop in letting the plant be the star of the show so that that can be the pop of green that everyone is focusing in on. Um, and then following that, arrangements versus larger potted plants. And over the course of three years, I've found that people tend to fall in one of two camps, if you will. You can see here that I fall into this sort of both of them. And those two camps are people are looking for really large potted plants to be their statement piece, or they're looking for smaller plants and they're getting multiple of those and making their own sort of mini indoor jungle in an arranged space. So camp one, for example, the bold pop of color coming from something like a bird of paradise, maybe that massive fiddle leaf fig that's in your dentist's office um, or an elephant ear plant, for example. Um, people that have higher ceilings, um, more floor space, they're looking for things that sort of serve as a piece of architecture in their home. And one of the best ways that that can be sold is if it's in a plain planter, white, black, or terracotta. So it can sort of serve as a blank slate. And you're giving the buyer, or the person coming into the store, the option to decide, how do I want this to be the main staple or the main piece of architecture within my home? Um, and then the second camp is um, smaller tabletop surfaces, or whether it's windowsills or just a side table. Um, and you're giving the buyer the, I guess, the creativity, if you will, to create their own sort of a mini arrangement. So textured planters are different colored planters with different patterns are the best way to do this. So for example, while this might not look like a classic terracotta, it is made out of a clay and it has these sort of white speckles on them. And so while this looks like a standard classic shaped pot, you can then pair it with something like maybe a propagation of a pothos, for example, and something that's sort of funky and different shaped. So you're giving people the option to create something that they wouldn't otherwise find if it's just in a simple nursery pot. So you can sort of think of it as selling the dream when you go into a store and you see that window display. If you're automatically playing with layers and height and color, you're giving people access to something they wouldn't otherwise think to put together. Um, and so the last sort of big component here is scheduling is key. Um, people are catching on to the idea that plants have different needs. They all, um, they vary in height, color, and we're starting to also understand that all of our windows are facing a different way. And so while you might Google the plant care for Monstera Deliciosa, for example, you might get conflicting information, but the one thing that none of uh, these sources take into account is that everyone's window is facing a different way and they're getting different intensity and amounts of light. So the thing I've been seeing the most over the past three years is plant shops and nurseries are selling and arranging their plants in different ways. And this is all about knowing your audience, of course. The most common and I find the most helpful way to display plants within a space is organizing them based on either type the need or the style. 
So we can dive into that a bit deeper type of plant. Maybe all of your philodendrons are in one corner. And while some of them might be long and viney, others of them might be have fuller leaves and might grow nice and tall. The other way that you can style is based on needs. So, and I, I would recommend this way of selling because that's the way that most people are starting to understand their plants and the ones that they can care for. And so by need means how often does this plant need water? So while you might have a succulent and another sort of philodendron that they both happen to need water once every two or three weeks, depending on how much light they're getting, you can put those together and have people understand the idea that this is a plant that you can care for because they're on a similar schedule. Um, so that's just one way to make plants a bit more accessible and understanding plant care. And then finally, style. Maybe it's you're putting all of your long vining plants together, all of your massive, tall, banana-shaped leaves together, um, or you're putting all of your cacti and succulents together. So when you're considering displays and ways to reach an accessible or reach an audience to make things accessible, you want to sort of consider the way that they would take this plant home start designing it on their own and you can sell the dream within your store on a display so that they already have an idea of how to do that. Um, so those are the main trends um, that I and patterns that I've seen over the past couple of years and I hope that these make buying and making or make plants accessible for everyone um, as you continue to figure out which plants are sort of in the trends right now and which ones people are not necessarily drawn to anymore because there are ways that you can make them more accessible and fun by putting them in a cool planter, maybe arranging by different heights or just making them, um, locating them differently within a store to make them accessible to different people. So thank you for your time. And I'm really looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mariah. We'll start our Q&A momentarily, but first, Lisa Heredia would like to think, uh, take a moment to thank each one of you personally for attending today. Hi there, thank you for taking the time to join our Trends webinar. We hope that you found it interesting and informative. Our speakers discuss color and design trends along with retail merchandising ideas. This all impacts forecasting and what will appeal to our end consumer. Hopefully you were able to gather information that was useful to help you in your go-to-market decisions in the future. We wish you a successful 2022 season and beyond. And from all of us at Danziger, we invite you to always imagine more. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you again to Peggy and Phil and Mariah for um, joining us today and giving us a glimpse into uh, trends, whether it be with colors or tropicals or the uh, landscape industry. So we have a few questions from our audience. Um, Mariah, I'm gonna start with you. Um, what are some design trends where indoor plants can be used outdoors? Sure. And again, thank you so much for having me. Um, I get this question a lot, especially around the springtime. Like I said, I'm here in New York City. And so any place that people can bring their plants right to their balconies or maybe even fire escape sometimes is the way to go. Um, so yes, to answer your question, um, you can just about most of the plants that you get, you can let your indoor plants have their day in the sun. Um, and I think this is something that's great that we should cover because you can market them as decor items that can be outside as long as you're giving the consumer the instructions with how to care for them once you bring them inside. So mm -hmm. letting them know that, oh, you might have to water a little bit less or more often based on how much or how little sun it's getting once it's moved inside or brought outside. So providing people with instructions before making that move is the best way that you can market that indoor outdoor transition. Um, and the other thing that I'd love to speak to is the idea of all of the benefits that come from houseplants. And I feel like a lot of um, nurseries and plant shops have been marketing plants this way. Um, mm -hmm. Best air purifying plants or plants with benefits that increase productivity since a lot of people had the luxury and privilege of working from home. Um, I made the investment to have a large plant in my space so that I could really boost my mood. Um, so I think having that, using that as a tool for marketing as well as something that can be extremely helpful um, for people who are interested in buying. Mm -hmm. And um, one other question for you from our audience is, um, so is the tiny plant trend still relevant? 
the tiny plant trend, it seems like it was so long ago, but we all sort of kept up with that like miniature plant thing. Um, and it's really fun and I still see it exists sometimes. Um, but I think a, people, are, instead of having one or two tiny plants, I've clearly gone the opposite and went with a massive plant. But for people that do go with the tiny plants, they like to get multiple and create little arrangements, as I mentioned before. So whether it's on a windowsill or like on a display, once you enter someone's home, it's just a really nice pop of green. Um, and I think it was Phil that spoke to the idea of like low maintenance um, is the way to go. And people are sort of seeing plants um, in a different light based on how much uh, they're willing to care for them based on their needs. So in short, the tiny plant trend is still around. I think people are just sort of expanding with what they can do with those tiny plants. Okay, thanks. Awesome. And um, so I'm gonna jump over to you. Um, this question um, goes kind of with what uh, Mariah just said, um, as far as like benefits, you mentioned gardens with a purpose. Now, I, I know that you were talking about, um, you know, whether it be an office or a playground or, or whatever, but um, we have a question about uh, related to gardens with a purpose. How can growers work with landscape customers to select plants that have a purpose? Um, that's a great question. So I think, um, it really goes to, uh, I think, how I said that landscaping has really become purposeful. Um, people know what they want, and that's probably a lot from being able to go on the internet, um, shop hows, shop, you know, all these Pinterest, and, and see all these different ideas. So I think that us kind of partnering with growers is one of the things, actually, that it has been... Um, I think challenging, but also very fun for people in our industry because there's new varieties that bloom longer, um, that you know are shade tolerant, that are low maintenance. So our plant palette changes yearly based on you know what growers are producing um, at the nurseries, and um, you know there's a program here in Colorado called Plant Select. Um, that is actually designed working with growers on plants that are native, on plants that um, grow in our region. Um, and I think almost every region has that where they're really producing plants um, for that specific area. Mm -hmm. On another question for you, um, what role does the landscape industry play in educating all of those new growers that you mentioned and how can growers work as partners with um, people like, you know, with landscape architects and designers when it comes to educating these, all these new gardeners? I would say probably through their associations. Um, I know that the green industry um, is very collaborative and, it, uh, it, you know, and so I would say getting involved um, with the associations in your area where you have greenhouse growers, you have nursery owners, you have landscapers, you have maintenance, you have arborists, and all of those work together um, in a, a collaborative process. So I would say getting involved in your associations is where growers can probably get the most information. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll stand by. We've got uh, some more questions. Peggy, I'm gonna jump to you uh, for this question. Uh, some horticulture trends often start in Europe and make their way to North America. Can the same be said about color trends? Absolutely. Um, we're definitely seeing more of that crossover. Um, we cover four different regions when we're doing our world color forecast. And um, not only the stories crossing over and being similar um, be from region to region, but also the colors. And maybe it'll hit at a different time or maybe it'll hit at the same time. Um, but because we're so um, digitally connected now, um, our, our, you know, the things that are influencing us are um, worldwide. It's not, mm -hmm. not, not so specific. We may, we may react to the things that, we're, that are influencing us a little bit differently, but we're all getting a lot of the same influences. Okay. And um, another question for you. Um, Melanie wants to know which industries do you typically see pick up these color trends the most assertively and showcase them the quickest? 
Well, our, our membership comes from all different industries ranging from um, consumer electronics to commercial, residential, um, from building products to home decor. So it's people that are coming into these workshops and bringing their ideas from all, yeah. all the different um, industries. Um, I will say they're probably the biggest bulk though of our membership is in um, commercial and residential design. And those are the areas that you probably would see more um, direct application of the stories continuing on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's see, Shirley says that orange was a popular color in our greenhouse last year. Is that gaining more momentum still? Um, I think, um, the warm colors are gaining, um, maybe not specifically just orange, but definitely that whole terracotta e um, rose, um, a lot of Scandinavian influence, I think, came with those softer um, terracotta oranges, um, but the bolder oranges too. So um, I, I wouldn't see it going away, um, but you'll see other colors coming in as well. Okay. Let me breeze through these questions. Bill, this one's for you. Um, do you see a preference for annuals or perennials when it comes to um, the, your clients that you're designing for? I think both are pretty equally important. The way I like to talk to our customers uh, about the difference between annuals and perennials is I think the value that annuals bring with giving you a constant you know, pop of color all summer long um, is really important in incorporating those. What we are finding though is people like to incorporate those in their perennial beds so that when we have those lag seasons, when maybe something isn't blooming, the, the annuals really pick up and, and fill in that void. Um, as we all know, kind of the purpose of a perennial garden is to have something starting in the early spring and carrying out through you know, the fall. Um, Every so often there's that lag season in between that annuals really pick up um, and play an important role in the garden. Mm -hmm. um, another one for you, Phil, um, one of our attendees wants to know what your favorite type of plant is when it comes to adding color and texture. Would that be perennials, shrubs, trees, annuals, mixture? <laughs> I, I would say it's perennials. Perennials give us so much opportunity to, to um, play with texture and color. Um, and not only that, um, the color with just the foliage itself. So using the foliage, not only just the flower color, um, I think in perennial gardens play a, an important role. So um, yes, those are all very important. Okay. Mariah, um, we've got a question here about regarding house plants, there's so much activity around rare plants, but there, but there are widely available plants that people are getting excited about. Oh, but um, are there any widely available plants that people are getting excited about, like pothos, et cetera? Yes, that's a really good question. And I think that um, people found that all of these rare plants, like the pink uh, princess philodendron and all of the ones that are sort of pricier in nature, I think there was sort of a craze about that during the pandemic because people realized that you could grow these, propagate them, sell them on Etsy and make some money. But as far as there being an interest and a love just in the beauty of the plant, definitely. I think long and viney plants like philodendrons, um, golden pothos, um, anything that can sort of grow long and viney that you can propagate and share with a friend has become increasingly popular, especially around the holidays. And truly, I think the best way to market plants like that, that are easy propagators, are ones that um, are ones that you can show during the holiday season, are ones that you can propagate and share with friends. Because I, everyone that I know loves being able to purchase something and then having a free gift to share with other people. So if you can sort of market it like the gift that keeps on giving, I think that's the best way to go about it. Mm -hmm. um, I also probably saw that Heidi mentioned something about the sort of like a campaign of like, what if the entire national um, horticultural industry took on this like plants are good for mental health, sort of like the we've, um, what is it, got milk or um, yeah, those major trends. I think that's an amazing idea. I would love to get behind that. 
Um, and then there was another question, uh, and this could go to, to anybody really. Um, Rebecca wants to know if there are any textiles or textures that are really growing in popularity. I would say from not necessarily from a plant perspective, uh, but just texture in general, because we're so deprived with living in this virtual world. So anything that has the, that tactile quality um, is important. And the more of it, if, if it's visual and tactile, um, if you could see that texture even better. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I could chime in, I was thinking um, one of the trends that I've seen, I immediately thought about plant stands. And I, I think while people are used to having a plant in a pot, um, there's something to be said for adding a bit more texture, whether it's a natural wooden plant stand or something that's maybe brass so that it matches all of the other random fixtures or features in your home to create a bit of a pop. Um, that's just one other subtle way that you can create a really beautiful display and give people the option of adding some more texture that's not in the plant or the pot. Mm -hmm. And speaking of plant pots, um, Lindsay asked uh, what materials are trending in plant pots or hardscape materials right now? Mariah or Phil, do you have any comment on that? Do you, uh, um, I'll talk to, I'll let Mariah talk about the plant pots. I'll talk about the hardscaping, but we're seeing natural materials um, is really what the trend is and softer colors. Um, I think there's so many opportunities with these outdoor living spaces, whether it's a manufactured tile um, that can be carried from indoors to outdoors, um, or it's a real stone um, that has been honed to a, a comfortable walking space. Um, we're doing very little of the, I guess, stamp concrete anymore. And it's all about um, unique and different materials. Um, a lot of these, um, Pavers can be done by the homeowner themselves. So that's also a nice benefit to that, that a lot of these um, can be DIY projects. Um, so I think that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your presentation about softening that up with plants, like how important that is. Yep. I, I think again, patio planters and pots, um, we use actually, Mariah, we use a lot of tropicals outdoors in the summer um, as kind of signature for the annuals. Um, we use a lot of specimen palms um, that then can be brought indoors um, when the cooler weather hits, if you're in a colder climate. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Peggy, Dennis would like to know if um, how you your company works with or it's influenced by the Pantone color palettes. Um, well, there are some Pantone people that are part of um, CMG. So, um, and we, whenever we create our color forecast, mm -hmm. um, we use a, a color system sort of as our standard. We use the NCS color system as the standard. Um, but then we also match it into many other, we give the RGB values and the Pantone matches and um, the RAL matches um, and Munsell. Um, so um, we definitely, we know what that we're kind of on, you know, we're together in workshops with um, representatives from Pantone. And um, so we all talk, discuss the same things we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, and someone asked about colors of the year. Um, so I know you talked about your, your color stories and your trends forecasts. Do you guys also um, identify colors of the year or is that left up? We to do. Okay. We do. We have, um, we pick what we call a key color for each region. Um, for North America this um, coming year, it's uh, called New Day and it's kind of a bluish, um, a, a medium tone blue with a little bit of red in it. Um, mm -hmm. The idea behind the key color is just to be able to talk about the story that brings that key color around. And so, um, and we all, the other two regions, we had um, an orange from Latin America called Despertar and two yellows from, a, one from Asia Pacific and one from Europe. So yellow was very important. Mm -hmm. And the, the person who asked that about, about colors of the year said that it seems that yellow and gold is staying another year. Mm -hmm. I think so. That was their um, 
I think it's the um, the optimism that we're um, that we have for the coming year. Coming out of this pandemic, we need some optimism, <laughs> some hope. Phil, um, one of our attendees would like to know: Are rocks as decorations within a yard a good trend in landscape architecture? Um, yes, I think um, if you mean rocks as in boulders and accent pieces, yes. Rocks okay. as a ground cover is kind of an outgoing trend. We're not doing a lot of rocks. We're using more mulch and natural products than um, using rock as a ground cover. Um, but we're definitely using big boulders um, as accents, um, whether it be in the garden or as water features. Um, so yes, boulder rocks, yes. Okay, and another one for you, Phil. Um, you, you talked about, you mentioned briefly in your presentation about uh, people incorporating vegetables with flowers. So this person would like to know, have you seen an increase in people using things like peppers or kale as an ornamental in with their other annual flowers? Yes, we're totally seeing, uh, and I think I mentioned in my presentation, people are looking beyond the ordinary, you know, typically a tomato on a patio pot, but they're really incorporating these gardens on their patios or in their gardens with kale, heirloom varieties, I think a lot of the unusual varieties, um, smaller cucumbers, um, and a lot of that is, is just, um, to feed a family of four, people tend to overplant. I'm sure you've heard people have bushels of cucumbers when they come in. So it's really educating people that, you know, it's one or two plants or else working with smaller varieties, miniature um, cherry tomatoes have been really popular. Um, so we are seeing a lot of the more, I guess, gourmet vegetables like kale and peppers and um, some of the miniature cucumbers and smaller varieties of squash um, out there. Okay. And uh, let's see here. Look at that one. Sorry about that. Um, are people ask, asking to incorporate greenhouses now in their landscape plans? And do landscape companies do this type of work? Um, Greenhouse growing or building a greenhouse is really specialized. So I, we do not build them. We do incorporate them into our designs, but we would then turn that over to a greenhouse uh, manufacturer um, to install and set up. Okay. Um, Peggy, I've got another question for you. Um, when you use color stories and marketing, how important is it to use those colors throughout the entire marketing message? Or is it enough to just use color in a pot or a pot wrap, for example? Uh, to, what was the second part of there, to use it? Is it is, how important is it to use it throughout the entire marketing message? Or is it enough just to say use a certain color in a pot or in a pot wrap? as opposed to throughout the entire um, marketing message, like with tags or? Well, I think it depends. I mean, it really does depend on what is appropriate for the, whatever, what the context is that you're using it in. Um, so yeah, you don't necessarily need to use every color that goes with that story. Um, mm -hmm. They're more, it's, it's less about um, that being a palette to go with the story. And it's more about using the story um, to explain why those colors are moving in the direction that they are. Um, okay. and, and, and again, less about the specific color and more about what is that direction that it's going, you know, that the, the reds are moving more orange or that they're moving more blue. And, and that's kind of what we wanna key in on when we're giving our forecast. So it's what, so then it's up to the, um, um, the producer to then to decide what works best for their product and what fits best with their overall message that they're trying to, to tell. Mm -hmm. For growers who are, um, especially for the greenhouse growers, you have those shorter term crops. How far out are you guys forecasting um, in case they wanted to mirror some of those colors with you know, some of the varieties that they're gonna grow the following year? Well, we, we do our forecast two years out. So we just presented at our summit, the 2023 forecast. And then in our workshops coming up, we're gonna be talking about 2024. 
So it's a little hard for me to <laughs> keep track of what year I'm in sometimes. Um, but, you know, we're, again, I, I'll go back to the, what I said before about the directional movement, because we're, we're following that, you know, from year to year, how are the colors moving? And, and, and that's the most important thing that we want to keep in mind. And then that sort of sets us up to look further into the future is to, is it all, because it'll all follow that same path or what colors are, you know, working together with each other now and are those going to continue on those combinations? Mm -hmm. Mariah, um, Heidi would like to know if you could pick a house plant type trend, what would it be? I feel like that changes every single day. There's one plant that goes viral every day. So it's so funny. We're talking about trends and Peggy, you were looking years out. I am daily trying to keep up with like the new thing and be the millennial voice. <laughs> um, but I'd have to say if there was a, a type of plant that's sort of trending right now. I would say um, tropicals is such a general world, word, but any sort of tropical with a large leaf, people have been really, really interested in. And I think it's because speaking for New York City or at least big cities, we're limited in space. And so if we are gonna A, make that financial investment into a very large plant, um, and we also just want a huge pop of green or, um, because let's face it, like the finances are the biggest concern when we're making the investment in a living thing and we're not sure if we can care for it. Um, we want something that's really going to blow your mind when you walk into the room. So Monstera Deliciosa, I, I would say it's the most commonly asked for plant between all of my clients within the past year. The year previously, it was the fiddle leaf fig, but I think people caught on that if you don't have direct light, you are really going to have a tough time with that tree in your apartment. Um, and so... As a plant doctor, I was grateful because that served as a lot of business for me, but it was really sad to see how many people were struggling with this plant. So mm -hmm. overall, if you can find a plant that, um, if people are looking for a new plant, I would say that it's anything with a really large leaf, um, such as a banana leaf, Monstera deliciosa, any alocasia plant um, with a huge, uh, with big foliage up top, those are the ones that are really intriguing people right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, same question, another question from Heidi, what about the succulent trend? Are you still seeing that as a top trend or is that starting to lose a little steam? I think it's starting to lose a little steam. And I would, I say that because they were originally marketed as a low maintenance plant. I don't truly, I think it's relative to uh, what you might need to give a fern, a Boston fern, for example, you don't need to mist it and make sure that it has all that humidity, but they do need some love and care. And so I think people were just simply looking for a plant that they could have on the windowsill or on their desk and just completely forget about. But um, over time, I think people were realizing that they do need a little bit more care and you can't just totally neglect them. But on the other side of that, I think COVID really played a role in the types of plants people are looking for because we wanted low maintenance before because we were never really home. And so those same low maintenance plants that people had in their homes once everyone came inside for COVID, we were so freaking bored that we just wanted to care for our plants and everyone overwatered their low maintenance plants. <laughs> so I think now people are looking for something that needs a little bit more love, maybe once or twice a week, or can I miss it? Can I do something? But if you have cacti and succulents that enjoy having their soil dry out, you're really, those aren't going to be your best friend if you're looking for something to do while you have your coffee in the morning. So, um, <laughs> Some people are still really interested in succulents, but I think the big thing is uh, people are looking for something to care for more often. Mm -hmm. uh, Joy would like to know, Mariah, how you help people get over the problem of customers saying that they have a black thumb or always kill plants, which makes them not purchase plants. That is literally how I started my business in 2018. I um, had this idea that I was just so sick of hearing people say, I don't have a green thumb or I have a black thumb, et cetera. And at this time I was teaching in the classroom and I was just starting this sort of side hustle because I realized I could keep about just, just about any plant alive. And in that time, I took something from the classroom when I was teaching third grade and it was that it's not that you're bad at math or you're bad at reading or you're bad at whatever skill it is that you're trying to achieve. It's that you haven't found the right book or the right teacher or method to learn what it is that you're trying to learn. The same exact thing applies with houseplants. And so growing up, I thought I was terrible with plants, 
But my mom, I grew up in Tokyo and we had all of these bonsai trees. And so I just wanted to love on them and water them every day. And I just thought, oh, I don't have a green thumb. They just keep dying. But I was drowning these plants that didn't need love every single day. So um, when I first started the business, my slogan was sort of the right plants for the right person in the right space. So if you can get that equation to balance, you can dismantle this whole idea of the green thumb. Um, and while I really want to do that, the day that that becomes true, I'll no longer have a job, but I'm hopeful and optimistic that it will catch on at an even pace. Right. Um, Mariah, are you seeing um, fruit trees as indoor plants with some of your uh, clients? Am I seeing them? No, but am I being asked for them? Yes. And it makes my job kind of tricky because I then have to go to my local nursery. Hicks Nursery is the biggest one um, out here that I frequent, or at least the plant shops that I source from will get their plants from. Um, but seasonally, it's really tough. Um, and one popular one is a lemon tree. Um, people really, really seem to want lemon trees right now. Um, but it's all about, again, like the fiddly fig, having the lighting, having the space. Um, so my clients that live in Tribeca are in these really beautiful, nice high rise buildings that have that space. Um, fruit trees have become increasingly more popular, but I do have a bit of a waiting list for when those come in. Bill, what about you as far as landscape design goes? Are you seeing more fruit trees? We are. We're seeing anything that uh, a little bit like Mariah said, you can tend to and take care of uh, um, and, and watch grow its fruit is, is huge. I, I think vegetable gardens and orchards, I've seen probably a 50% growth in all of that. And I think every job now has a garden on it in some shape or form, um, whether it be a patio pot or whether it be a full on, you know, garden. Um, mm -hmm fruit trees have definitely had an increase. And as Mariah alluded to, they're even hard to, apples and all those, are, they're hard to keep in stock. So um, by mid season, usually most of the nurseries are sold out of those. So we definitely are um, planting a lot of fruit trees and actually berry producing raspberries, blueberries, that as well. Mm -hmm. And Cynthia would like to know um, from you, Phil, with climate change, have you had to change a lot of your designs to accommodate this? Um, yeah, I, I think again, it, it really is not, where it's really made an impact on our business is really on our irrigation systems. Um, not so much on the plants, but how we water things, how often we water things, um, and a little bit like, Kind of Mariah said, we tend to overwater all the plants. Um, we see something that wilts, we tend to give it water, and a lot of times that's the same symptom as overwatering. Uh, so, um, with climate change, we're just seeing more and more less, we're having to water less with the warmer temperatures um, and adjust our irrigations a little bit more frequently. Mm -hmm. Peggy, this one's for you. Uh, does incorporating color stories into how you display seem to be popular for customers as they experience the retail or garden center space? Uh, I think so. I mean, if you're if you relate them to um, you know to their home and how it's going to to work in their home and how what the the story sort of being the impetus of of where the mindset is going and what they're um, what they're desiring in the in the final output of in their home. So I think that's the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And does anybody have any comments um, this um, on um, how people move throughout a retail space as far as um, Mariah, you talked a little bit about merchandising and layering and things like that. And Andrea is wondering about um, what's trending in terms of how people move about the retail space. Can you repeat the last part? I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, when it comes to displays, what is trending in terms of how people like to move about in the retail space? Um, I think I, I sort of spoke to the idea of selling the dream, right? And so mm -hmm. while it's staying up with the trends on Etsy and what's going on on TikTok and the 
find this terracotta planter with this pothos plant hanging out with this grow light from X and you can click um, and immediately be taken to those things. I think if you can sort of set up um, different aesthetics or displays, think of it like Ikea, right? So like we go into that one room in Ikea and that's just not for us, but they did it pretty nicely, whoever that's for, good for them. But then if you go into the other space, that's sort of a minimalist aesthetic. Um, we realize that you can get one or two of those items from that space, but you're not going to walk away with that whole Ikea feel unless you do the whole thing. So mm -hmm. you really want to set up a display with everything that someone will need to take home to make it work. And I think this is a beautiful time to talk about one of the things that people are catching on to is that plants are not meant to be in that nursery pot past a certain date. They realize that uh, plant shops are purchasing plants from the nursery and within the next couple of months, that plant is going to start to get really sad because it's out of room and the soil is nutrient deficient. And so people are catching on that you need to purchase a pot that's about an inch or two larger in diameter so that you can plant it in there. So while it may look nice in the display to sit a perfectly a perfect three inch plant into a three inch pot so it sits perfectly, that's not attractive to someone who's buying because they know that they need a bigger planter to give that plant a little bit more room so it can make it into the next year. So that's something that I would do because I think people are sort of seeing plant shops and thinking, oh, they may just be wanting to get rid of their inventory. But the honesty and the direct consumer knowledge about how to care for this plant is becoming more attractive. So it's aesthetic and also knowledge. Um, Rebecca would like to, she has a two part question, one for Mariah and one for Phil. So this is what she says. We want our customers to succeed when growing their plants. Is there one particular aspect of plant care that we should really focus on in the plant tag or literature? It can be challenging to fit all on a plant tag. So we'd love to dial in on the information that will be the most helpful to a new plant parent. I would love to hear from both Phil for outdoor plants and Mariah for indoor. You want to go? I more than happy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. I'm glad this is so insightful. Um, yes, uh, to answer your question, I think lighting is the key. Um, you can find a lot of information online about water, but like I mentioned, I think people are catching on to the idea that lighting is going to be make or break about whether or not this is the right plant for your space. So while the Monstera deliciosa is being marketed as a beginner friendly plant, that means nothing. If you are being blasted with direct light all day and that thing is going to fry, or if you're living in a ground level unit and you only have one small window that's north facing and you're not getting any light. So I, it's that idea of it's easier beginner friendly for whom. Um, but the one thing I saw recently at a plant shop and I have to shout out the plant shop and give them credit. It's called Tula House uh, Plants here in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. They have a QR code for every type of plant. You take your phone, you put it directly, just like a menu, like we've been doing for COVID and all that information pops up online. So you don't have to worry about jamming all of that into a little tag. Um, and that's something that I've been doing for my clients as well. So once I bring in a large bird of paradise, um, your plant care that you receive following our session is a QR code and it has everything you need to know. So that's just an easy tech update since we're all on our phones all the time, might as well get a QR code for that too. And I would say kind of on the outdoor side of it, um, that size and, and height, so width and height is very important, especially to a do-it-yourself homeowner in making sure that you have the layering that you want, that you're not putting a a shrub or a plant that gets five feet in front of something that gets two feet. So I think the size and shape, you have also probably seen people plant shrubs or spruces, you know, four feet off their foundation. And in five years, they have to cut it down because, you know, it's grown too big. So I think it's really important to give that space a little bit like Mariah said with your potted plant, the same way applies to outdoors that you need to look at that mature size of that tree that it's going to get and place it properly within your yard or else, you know, it's going to have to be taken out at some point because you didn't follow kind of the direction. So I think the most important thing for an outdoor plan is looking at the size and height of that mature plant. 
I'd say that applies for indoor too. People really want the massive tree in their apartment and it might be sold in a 17 inch diameter nursery pot. And then you're putting it in a 20 inch planter in three years, that thing is going to be so overgrown and you might have to move. Um, and I've sort of run into this problem right now. I wanted a massive plant and it's just gotten so big. So that's also another thing that applies for indoors too. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for all your time and attention today. And um, we've uh, we got a lot of really fantastic information today. Um, if you uh, joined us a little late, I do want you to know that this uh, webinar was recorded and it will show up on our websites in just a few days. So pay attention to greenhousemag.com and gardencentermag.com and uh, you'll be able to watch this later or share it with your staff. Um, again, I wanna thank Danziger for the opportunity to bring um, these panelists to you. Once again, Phil, Peggy, and Mariah, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs>